Hi everyone, thank you for coming tonight. So I hope you didn't eat too much yet, because you're going to see lots of poops to remain polite, and literally like, lots of it. Um, so as Raymond mentioned before, I'm, I'm a disgust nerd, so I have a weird fascination for everything that is icky. So let me first um, take you where this weird fascination for very different stuff. And this is Koshima Island, Miyazaki Prefecture, in the south of Japan, where Japanese primatology started, so the study of primates, uh, started in the late 40s with um, Miss Satsue Mito, who started observing Japanese macaques on this island. And since then, the macaques um, have remained there, and they are provisioned with grains of wheat, two to three times a week. So the wheat is distributed on the beach, and as the beach is the feeding site, it's also a defecation site, because monkeys chase each other, and they want to get the food, so they get spread out, and then they just poop everywhere. So the mission of these monkeys is to basically avoid the poops, um, getting the grains of wheat, but interestingly, you would see that all the grains of wheat that accidentally hit the top of feces would just remain there. The macaques would not touch it. Um, and then, if we zoom in, we may realize that macaques have good reasons to do so. They have good reasons to not touch these grains of wheat. Because if we zoom in a bit closer, this is the view of a macaque fecal sample under a microscope. So, and what we can see basically is lots of parasites. You can see a parasite larvae here, um, living around, and parasite eggs. Um, the white spots that stand out are parasite eggs. And if we, if we zoom a bit closer again, we can see a parasite larvae. This is a parasite called Strongyloides, dancing on this wonderful background music that a few of you in this room may know. Um, at the Kyoto University Primate Research Institute, every day at 5 p.m. we have that wonderful song. So when we have the opportunity to observe fecal samples at 5 p.m. in the lab, that's the song that accompanies us. <laughs> and the parasites. So these parasites are basically acquired um, by the macaques by touching contaminated substrates around and then subsequently putting their hands into the mouth as a feed or as juveniles and human infants would do sometimes just putting their hands into their mouth. And thus ingesting infective parasite larvae or infective parasite eggs. So that's basically the process of how they acquire um, present infection. And this is the case for the Japanese macaques of Koshima Island. Um, as you know, there is no hand sanitizer there, no toilets, and potentially lots of infected mates for them. And that's also true for other primates. It's not only Japanese macaques. This is true for a wide range of other primates, including us uh, humans. So, as such, it's imperative for their survival to uh, develop strategies to avoid these parasites. And this is known as the art of parasite handling, where A stands for avoidance. Um, I'm going to give a quick example here um, using you guys. So, as you can see in this room, we are all kind of sitting from a certain distance between each other. And this is potentially also a preventive strategy from getting infected by what your neighbor, your stranger neighbor, may harbor if like, <laughs> he has even a common flu and is just like spitting around, <laughs> you may get, you may acquire this, this virus, for example. Um, resistance is the ability to um, diminish or reduce infection with the help of our physiological immune system, so with the help of antibodies, um, for example. And tolerance is um, our adaptation to live with a given parasite by limiting its harmful effects. But note that avoidance is our only preventive strategy to avoid uh, parasite infection. 
that's the one I, I want to focus on here. And if we think, so what triggers avoidance? Well, disgust does. And disgust does trigger avoidance through a wide diversity of stimuli, as maybe you can see on the pictures. Enjoy your meal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A few, a few warms. Um, but disgust is basically a three-step process. So where first we would have to detect and other primates as well parasite presence in a contaminant, for example, poop. This would then send um, informations and warning signals to um, activate a specific area of the brain, which is called the insula, and which would then provoke this response with the characteristic facial expression of disgust, such as nose wrinkling and upper lip raised. This is the case for uh, human primates. We don't know yet for non-human primates. Which would then ultimately lead to this avoidance of parasites. So let me, yeah, let me illustrate um, this, this disgust uh, process with a, a small experiment here. So I would need a, a volunteer, like maybe quickly, to come here and to just plunge the, the hand into this box here. Um, <laughs> yeah, one, one of you guys, you are well. Okay. Yeah, please. Yes, you, you. <laughs> oh, well, you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so you just um, put your hand into this. Uh, <laughs> and then you tell us what you feel. <laughs> you don't have to go too far. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it's more sticky than I assume. So, <laughs> okay. so as you can see, um, Vanessa, if I'm right, she just, yeah, she did this like kind of yuck uh, facial expression, which means that she probably felt disgusted, but she was nice enough to <laughs> keep her hand into this part. So, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, but the reason why Vanessa felt disgusted is because these, um, it's basically a dough in there. It's more sticky than I wanted to because <laughs> on the way something happened in the shoe but, um, So, um, yeah, moisty, sticky, and like kind of wet substrates in nature in general are more. Um, uh, like there is a higher correlation that these uh, may have or, or may be pathogenic. So this is why we would have um, evolved this aversion for sticky, moisty substrates. And I, I will come back to, to this later. So back to our grains of wheat here um, that remain on our pieces. So after, after realizing or after observing this, um, I decided to conduct a few experiments to investigate or to dig a bit further into this poop world. So let me start with an experiment that um, I conducted in Koshima Island um, with Japanese macaques. So here are three substrates, basically. You have uh, the fake macaque poop on the, on the left here. Um, this around. <laughs> <laughs> you have a piece of plastic notebook in the middle, and you have the real macaque poop uh, here on the right. And on each of these substrates are uh, were deposited a grain of wheat. So she, this female already ate the grain of wheat on the piece of plastic notebook in the middle, but both grains remain on the fresh and on the fake poop here. So you can see that. After some hesitation, she, she finally goes for it, but she, she meticulously wraps the grains of wheat before, um, before eventually eating it with her wrists. So when we replicated this experiment with um, 16 individuals in total, we observed that all of them, across all trials, fed on the piece of plastic notebook. But only 6 out of 16 fed atop the real macaque poop, and 9 out of 16 fed atop the fake plastic poop. But 
But this was for the wheat condition. Remember that they are provisioned with grains of wheat. So this is like their usual food. They are not fond of it. Um, but if now you switch to their favorite treats, which is peanuts, that they very, very rarely receive. This is like chocolate for us, or for me. So if you switch to a more um, calorific reward, and which is much more attractive to them, then all the 16 other drugs would feed on all substrates. So there is this, this what we call a trade-off between um, potential infection risk um, and also a reward, and here is the nutritive value of it. So let me take you now to another location. Uh, this is uh, Lola Yabonobo Sanctuary in the DR Congo, um, in Kinshasa, where I aim to replicate a chain of uh, contagion. I got inspired from an experiment that has been conducted in, in humans, actually, uh, not with poops and slices of bananas, but with uh, pencils and identified contaminated objects. So the experiment was, let's say, I take this pencil, I'm going right now to the bathroom, and I rub this pencil very hard to the toilet paper. Then I would propose to you to sign me a book or whatever. Would you take it? Remember what I've just done. Yeah. <laughs> um, then there is a second pencil that is rubbed on that first pencil, and again, I propose whether you would take it. Would you? Okay. So you are pretty, pretty sensitive. And, and so forth. So a third that is rubbed, rubbed on the second, and etc. So the idea here was to replicate this chain of contagion and to test um, the disgust sensitivity in bonobos um, through this. So we have six slices of bananas, this individual takes slice number four first and puts it into the mouth, then slice number six, takes slice number three, touch the nose, touches number two, but doesn't go for it, smells number five and puts it into the mouth. So what we observe here is basically that the proportion of individuals who fed, and this is true for the 50 bonobos that uh, I tested, the proportion of individuals that fed uh, gradually increased as we get farther from the contaminant, so the bonobo poop here. And that also means potentially that um, they avoid, like as we get farther from the contaminant, the risk of infection probably diminishes. You have to note as well that 23% of the 50 individuals tested, they entered the experimental area, they were faced with this table, the poops and the slices of bananas, they saw it, and they just refused to take any slices of bananas. So you observe this heterogeneity among individuals. Okay, a last one with uh, chimpanzees here, uh, and this test was uh, done in Gabon. So here is basically the, the experiment, or another version of it, that Vanessa has just uh, performed right now. So in this box, um, the substrate was either a piece of dry and hard uh, rope here, or, or a dough, so a soft and moist um, dough. And this is the dough condition. <laughs> She seemed to be more reactive than, than Vanessa, but, um, but so what we observed here with these um, 20 chimpanzees is that, so if, if it was the doe, they would see me, what I, I didn't mention, in the box, so I attracted them by putting a piece of banana. So they would see that I, I placed a, a slice of banana, but they wouldn't know on which substrate it relied on. So this was either the doe or, or the rope. Um, and after touching the dough, they would just withdraw the hand. They would not go a third time for it. They would not take the, the piece of banana. Um, but in the rope condition, they did so. And now this is um, another version again of this experiment with my aunt recently in Kyoto, um, who experienced touching these weird um, soaps that you have here. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a bit biased because here she had the visual cues. Um, she could see that sticky and moisty soap. 
um, she had the same kind of avoidance reaction, but at the same time it's fun because she knows it's a soap, she knows she is in a gallery in Kyoto. So it's kind of when the safe, um, safe cues uh, enter into context, then um, it becomes fun. So what we have seen through these different experiments is that human disgust elicitors seem to also trigger an avoidance response in non-human primates. But as I mentioned earlier, we can also see variation among individuals. So this is what this graph represents here with an example in, in Japanese macaques. So each dot represents one individual. And this is basically their score on different hygiene proxies. So you have sweet potato uh, manipulation, and sweet potato washing, uh, so an individual who would um, score higher on this would follow that arrow. Um, then there is acorn rubbing when they look for food in the leaf litter in the forest. Um, some individuals would rub and manipulate the acorn before putting it into the mouth. And then the third hygiene proxy is this feces avoidance, so feeding a top um, real macaque poop, um, yes or no. So you can see, yeah, that individuals score differently on, on this hygiene access. But then, in blue were the females, <laughs> and in red are the males. So, females basically scored um, higher on hygiene than males did. Um, yeah, and that dirty male out there basically yeah, ate everything, <laughs> no washing, um, nothing. So, yeah, and... And interestingly, what we observed after is that those females who were more hygienic uh, than the males, they also had lower levels of parasite infection than the males. So there seems to be a, a correlation here, interestingly. So if I try to wrap up this um, talk, this through like a nerdy summary, um, I would say that all these primates um, manifested avoidance of human disgust elicitors. So this is true for um, the poops. I, I've mainly presented poops today, but um, I also tested other body liquids, um, such as semen and blood, through different sensory cues, so. and uh, rotten food as well. So either through sight, um, through smell, or through touch. Uh, we have also seen that this avoidance response correlates with low parasite uh, infection. So this is very fun work to do. I'm, I'm, I'm very into to what I do. Um, I have lots of funny anecdotes as well. Um, one of them is like, for example, this is like making those crops at like 2 a.m. before going on a field trip uh, on my balcony. Uh, but I'm always embarrassed when I uh, put those <laughs> fake poops around. Like, Earlier at the station, when I had to switch bags and I was quickly like, putting this out, or being stuck at the customs in the country, <laughs> and I have basically, when I went to Gabon, I had a bag like full, full of these. I had hundreds of these, and the officer, the Gabonese officer in front of me, started opening all bags, and I said, like, "I'm stuck there." <laughs> um, but I don't know. Like, luckily, I, I was the first one. He just said, "Go." So I, I, I was, um, so just to say, yeah, this is, this is very fun, but I think this work could have also important uh, applications, um, such as conservation applications. So what you may not know is that most of these primates that I tested are actually um, endangered. They are classified endangered by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, and one of the reasons is basically us. So, our habitat is expanding, their habitat is um, diminishing. And this creates some human wildlife or human primate conflict. As their habitats, um, as they are losing their habitats, then they may invade agricultural fields, for example. And so this, in host countries, causes lots of troubles with the local populations. So one could think of using non-human primate disgust as a way, for example, to deter them or prevent them from entering those agricultural fields. So this is something I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to develop in the future. Um, another aspect of conservation application, for example, is um, ecotourism. So 
some people, maybe including ourselves, are ready to pay a lot to see mountain gorillas in Uganda, for example. But most of them are unaware of the risk that they may cause to these endangered primates, um, and the risk that they may also get into by exposing themselves to parasites and pathogens that can be transmitted. So one could think of using uh, human disgust in that aspect to uh, keep certain distances and wear a mask before uh, or in front of a gorilla, for example. So this is, yeah, this is um, something I'm very excited about to, to develop in the, in the near future. And as a transition to, this is my, my last slide, so as a transition to our next speaker, I think, here, who would um, speak about art and science, I wanted to say that this guest, I think, is a great source of inspiration for art as well. Um, you may know or not know this disgusting food museum. This is uh, in Sweden, in Malmö. There is now a new exhibit in, in Los Angeles. And, well, they exhibit uh, disgusting food from all over the world. So the, uh, the people can go to the museum, uh, smell, smell the different items, taste them. Um, and I'm actually super excited because next weekend, that's where I'm going to be. So <laughs> we basically, yeah, I arrange a meeting with the director and we will discuss of how to uh, exhibit at this museum food disgust in primates. So this is quite, quite exciting. But there are other uh, projects that uh, got inspiration or that reflect disgust. I don't know if um, you may be familiar with some of them. So it's pretty, pretty disgusting. So the first one here by the British artist James R. Ford is called Boggy Ball. is basically a collection of his own nasal mucus for ah. two consecutive years uh, that he rolled into a ball and exhibited all over the world. So if you want to get famous, you know, <laughs> you have material to do it. Um, then there is the Dutch artist uh, Wim Del Roy, who created a machine called Cloaca, where he was able to completely reproduce the human digestive process and produce synthetic poops. So, I don't know, this is fascinating to me. <laughs> um, and that's it for me, so please enjoy your evening, enjoy your meal. <laughs> Okay, with that note, uh, the floor is open for some questions. This is age a variable factor. Like speaking as a father of two kids, yeah, yeah. my disgust <laughs> sensitivity went way down. Oh, <laughs> not be changing, the yeah. Is that something that's similar to one? Yes, so I, I guess there are two aspects in your question. If you mean like, if um, younger primates, and us included, are less disgusted in, in general. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. So there are, there are things that are innate, and there are things that I, I learned, um, that are learned in, in disgust. And we also observed, so I did not mention here, but that's what I tested in Bonobos. So in the 50 plus individuals we tested, um, there were infants, there were juveniles, there were adolescents, adults, so those different age categories. And we basically observe the same same kind of response. So they would just grab the food, put it straight to the mouth, or putting their hands into the mouth outside of a feeding context. And I think this is quite interesting. That's what we observe in human kids when they just put fingers into the mouth. Um, but this has the function uh, apparently to build their physiological immune system. So in humans, during the first five years of life, uh, we should be exposed to all these kind of um, substrates and potential parasites to build a stronger immune system later on. Um, and then whether as parents, like your disgust sensitivity diminishes, my guess would, uh, there, there, there is some research on that showing that um, you may be less disgusted with your own kids, but now I kind of dare you to change the, the diaper of like another kids um, that you don't know, that your response may be different. Gender slide where you saw the males and females. Mm -hmm. um, two questions: Is that something you see in many species? And 
Is there any explanation for that? So in primates, um, like linking hygiene and parasite levels of infection, this, this was the first uh, study. And I'm now, so I have a bunch of um, data for those other primate species that I haven't analyzed all fecal samples yet, so I can't yet answer, but I, that's what I want to look into. Otherwise, in general, in mammals, in animals, there is, um, and even in, in primates, if I'm right, there is a, what we call the male gaze parasitism. So males tend to have higher levels of infection than females. Um, and there might be different factors uh, at play, but like investigating whether behaviors, like parasite avoidance behaviors, um, could be one factor. Uh, yeah, it's very un un underlooked um, at the moment. But of course, like as I mentioned before, there are lots of different traders, social needs, um, nutritional needs, but also how the physiological immune system and the behavioral immune system may interplay. Like, you may be less disgusted if you have, or if you can afford it in a way, perhaps, with your physiological immune response. So you said that uh, if you have this logical variable there, so what, what about hunger? Is there any specific tests for hunger? Mm -hmm. uh, is there like a point like two days, I eat the poop, seven days, I eat the poop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I haven't tested that uh, directly yeah. for ethical reasons. Um, you may wonder also yeah, why I'm, I'm showing directly poops to uh, them, but just know that also in their environment where they are tested, they are constantly exposed to it also anyway. Um, but hunger, the hunger factor has been tested in humans, um, if I'm right, and yes, there is, uh, there is this trade-off. It's basically the same as the wheat versus the peanut thing. So if you are like super hungry, you're, you're more yeah, yeah, eager to, to go for it. I wonder, I wonder if like in humans that that happens too, like, oh, that ice cream I know is really bad for me, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Going back to the female and male discussion, within the female population, females, is there any difference of like the risk they'll take when they're pregnant or have a cat? Oh, sorry. Not a cat. <laughs> a baby, or, or if, if they're breastfeeding. Sorry, I study dolphins, so I call them cats. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like if they're breastfeeding, because they need more energy to create the milk, and when they're pregnant, they need more energy to grow the fetus. And even when they're actually having parents and infants, they need more energy, right? So, is there more risk in the, during that time, or I don't know if you have. There, there, there is, there should be more, I mean, more risk if they are pregnant. Um, but whether this is translated into a higher avoidance response, in short, like, currently we don't know. Um, we have potential, so this is a project like we have been discussing with Murai Masensei from the Wild Life Research Center, because we may have access to this data to test actually whether among the 16 uh, individuals that I tested in Koshima, which female were present, uh, pregnant at that time in this kind of thing. It would still be like a small sample size, if I would say, but, um, but it, it hasn't been looked at um, so far. Do we have time for one more question? Some bacteria might be 
much more direct in the transmission and infection point. Mm -hmm. And it's just not But that's also yeah, like longitudinal or long yeah. long term studies that yeah. we are lacking in primates. Yeah. Oh. Uh, sorry, we're gonna close. You can, you can ask your question later. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Uh, well, uh, with that, please give another round of applause to Steele.